Welcome to the Ransom Church. We're excited that you're with us uh, for the final week of our series, Double Dare. Uh, you know, we've, we've taken a, a playful approach to kind of introducing the series because we're, we're dealing with some heavier topics. And so we thought, well, let's take a playful, playful approach. But I don't want to, I want to, because of the playful approach, I don't want you to miss that important line that we've seen in that video all week. If your faith does not dare you to live differently, what difference does it make? That's what this entire series has been about. And so in the series Double Dare, we've been throwing down the gauntlet and double daring you to do some things that are actually wise, that will change your life for the better, that will uh, have a positive impact on things like your health and your spiritual walk and your family. And we've been daring you to, to chase these things, but I got to be honest, they're hard. Like none of them are easy. And hopefully you found, uh, if you've been here over the last five weeks, you found your one dare that you're going to embrace and challenge yourself and actually get better. If you haven't, or if you're here for the first time, guess what? This is it. This is your dare because there's none left. And so if you didn't choose one, here we go. This is yours. So today we dare you to get into the word. Now, I would argue this is one that we probably all need to take that we could all afford to do. And if you already chose a different dare and you're saying to yourself, man, I wish I would have known that one was coming. I, I would have waited. I give you permission, even though we said the whole series, you can only do one. I give you permission right now to do two as long as one of them is this one, okay? You can do your other one and do this one because ultimately scripture needs to be absolutely foundational to anything else we do in our faith, okay? So before we're going to lay out the, uh, the same pattern as the last few weeks, we're going to tap into the truth, we're going to lay out a dare, and then we're going to give you a call to action or an action step. So let's start with the truth statement, but before we get there, let me ask this question. Is God's word important? Right. You gave, the, you gave the Christian answer. Good job. Um, that, and that is the Christian answer. It's the right answer. It's the one we know. And it is true. Yes, it's important. However, research shows that even though Christians say it's important, most evangelical Christians don't live like the word is actually important. They don't apply it to their lives. They're not living uh, by its truth fully. They don't even know it. In fact, a few years ago, George Barna published the results of a survey on the state of the church that surveyed Christians about their relationship uh, with God and their level of scriptural knowledge. And what they found is their level of scriptural knowledge was fairly low. For instance, according to this particular survey, 48% of Christians could not name the four gospels. Okay. Uh, now, if you don't know them, don't feel bad. Just ask your neighbor. They probably know because one out of two know. So that would be good. 60% um, of Christians could not name five of the Ten Commandments. In other words, we just don't have a, a grasp of Scripture. And Barna came to the following conclusion. He said, Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't know what it says. And because they don't know it, they have become a nation of biblical illiterates. Ouch, right? Now add to that uh, the opinion of those outside the church. 25 years ago, uh, it was different, but in the last 25 years, there's been a radical shift in culture from people having... 25 years ago, people had at least a biblical framework. They maybe were neutral on, on the scripture, but they, they at least had basic understanding of some of the stories and things like that. That's not where culture is today. Most people don't know anything about it. Some go as far as to say, many actually, that the Bible is dangerous. Uh, it's a dangerous book, and that's particularly true among non-Christian millennials and younger, okay? David Kinnaman, in his book, Good Faith, sheds some light on this reality. He, he writes this. He said, one quarter, 25% of non-Christian millennials believe the Bible is a dangerous book of religious dogma that has been used for centuries to oppress people. 38% believe the Bible is mythology, and 30% say it is just a book of fairy tales. So I ask the question again, is the Bible important? We know that the right answer is yes. Yes, it is. But based on how society and how Christians are living, the answer is actually no. It's not at least as important in our lives as we think that it should be. And this is a far cry from uh, Hebrews, the words of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, we read this. It says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. This describes scripture as, as living, not dead. It's not just some old, worn-out book. It has the power to, 
to penetrate the truth and it penetrates to the core of your soul. It can cut to the heart of your inner life. And if you read it, it can expose the things in you that are not God's will. Okay, according to to this passage, there's no heart that is too hard. There is no soul that is too dark for God if he wants to, to reach in and change it, okay? If we will allow his work in our lives. And so clearly there is a dichotomy that exists between these verses in Hebrews and where most people are on God's word today. That leads us to the truth for today. And we're gonna give, I'm going to give you the whole truth statement and then we're going to sort of like break it down, okay? So here it is. Here's the truth statement. The Bible is God's standard for believers, but that doesn't make it important. The Bible is only as important in our lives as we choose to make it. Let's tear that apart, okay, because there's a lot in that. First of all, the Bible is God's standard for believers, okay? Second Timothy uh, chapter 3, Paul writes this. He says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The, the key pa- the part of the passage there is that scripture is God-inspired, or some translations would say it's God-breathed. It came out of his very mouth, right? Paul says this book, this, the Bible, is for Christians to be the standard for our lives, not this plus something else, just the Bible. It is our standard for what is true, which we got to admit to ourselves, means that there's actually absolute truth, that truth is not relative. There is true and there is false, and it's true. It also says that it is right, and it's our standard for right, which means if it says something is wrong, it's wrong. If it says something is right, it's right. It's the standard, okay? It is here to to correct us and to teach us and to guide us. It it, it also is there to help us teach others and to, to disciple them, to become a disciple maker. So if this is the case, why do people not want to follow it. Well, as it turns out, for a whole host of reasons. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I don't like to read. I can't understand the Bible. It's boring. It's old. It's not relevant today. Ultimately, these all boil down to one major reason. I don't like what the Bible requires of me. That's ultimately the only reason, if we believe it's God's word, not to get in it, because we don't like what it says. I don't like reading the Bible because, honestly, I don't want to change. And every time I open that stinking book, something's got to change. And I'm getting kind of sick of it. Leave me alone, God, right? It tells me I have to love my enemies and I got to forgive people who have hurt me. And I just, I don't want to. It points out, it calls all these things in scripture like sins and shortcomings. And I, I've, I've been living like, that's just my lifestyle. Those are my choices. That's my, it's my life. I can choose. And then it tells me it's wrong. And I, I don't really want to hear about it. It calls me to be generous. Nope. It says I should put myself, you know, put others before myself. I should lay myself down. Why would I want to do that? And so we don't like what it says. So we just don't want to look at it. See, the problem is I want the promises of God. I want the heaven and all that good stuff. I want the promises of God. I just don't want the requirements of those promises. And so we end up with kind of a catch-22 where I, I want to do the right thing. I want to follow Jesus. I want to live according to God's word. But you know what that thing says? right? The Bible is God's standard, but that doesn't make it important to us, which leads to the second part of the the truth. The Bible is only as important in our lives as we choose to make it. That's where we're going to spend most of our time today, so turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. If you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 366. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. You can follow along. If you don't own a Bible, please raise your hand keep this one. It's our gift to you. Now, if you have kept four or five of our Bibles, bring four back because you only need one. They all say the same thing. But if you, if you don't own a Bible, keep this one. It's our gift to you, okay? Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the scriptures. It's 176 verses in this psalm. Don't worry, we're not going to preach all of them, okay? Most of the 176 verses deal either with God's law or God's word, and specifically with how much the writer loves God's law and God's word, okay? But the main point of Psalm 119 is that if you are going to be a faithful person, you have to truly get in the word of God before you'll ever live out the will of God. You got to get in the word of God, you got to let it get inside of you so that it can affect your actions, okay? So we're going to dive into a small portion today, verses 9 through 16, 
and these verses speak to the value of God's word and the importance it should have in our lives. So let's jump in, starting with verse 9. And the author writes, How can a young person stay pure by obeying your word? I've tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you've given us. I've rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. Now that's packed. That, that passage is packed. And it wouldn't be hard to do a whole sermon series just on those verses. But the, the theme, the overarching theme is pretty straightforward. If you want to live the way God wants you to live, you have to look to God's word to show you how to do it. You have to keep your life in line with his standards. And that's accomplished by reading his word, by studying his word, and, and letting that word get inside you and shape your life, okay? And the psalmist starts with a powerful question. He writes, how can a young person stay pure? Now, if you don't consider yourself young anymore, you're not off the hook, okay? You, know, you can't like, yeah, young people, we're talking to you. This is for all of us. But the reality is, we know our lives, our path in life starts forming early, right? From a very young age, there are patterns of behavior that are being set. And all that the author is doing is giving this advice. He's saying, listen, the sooner you can get your life on God's course, the better. And not only that, but some scholars believe that young man, when he says, how can a young man stay pure, was actually a reference to himself. Like he was saying to God, God, I, there's this young man I know. I mean, it's not me, but like, it's a, this guy, like, how could he stay pure? You know, really what he's doing here is he's, he's not preaching this verse, he's praying it, okay? So the question he's asking, he's saying, what do I need to do? It's a question we all need to be asking. What do I need to do? What's a way that I can be done with sin? I can be free from just a constant pull of sin, and I can maintain purity in my life? I think that's like the pressing question for all Christians. It's a battle that we seem to be fighting every day. And the picture in the text is the picture of a big rut in the road. Your wheel is stuck in a big rut, a big pattern. When there is a big rut in your life, it can be very, very hard to get out of that pattern. Now, many would look at our society right now, and they would say, this is the worst the world has ever been. We're, in a, we're culturally in a rut big time. And I might be inclined to agree with you, and yet apparently this is not a new problem. It's been going on for 3,000 years, okay? And, and so he's asking the right questions. He's saying, hey, do you want to know how to live a holy life? Do you want to know how to sin less, how to have more victory, how to worship God more fully, and how to get out of your rut? You want to know how to do that? It all comes down to God's word. If God's way is important to you, God's word has to be important to you. It's the only way this works, okay? And he looks at three key thoughts on what this means. First, you have to actually want more of God's word. Is that true in your life? Do you want more of God's word than you currently have? He writes this, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. I've tried hard to find you. So he's looking for God. Now watch, don't let me wander from, he doesn't say from you, he says from your commands. You know the dependence on the word in that statement? He's saying, listen, I tried to find you and the only way I can look is I, I'm seeking you with all my heart, so I'm looking to your word. Th this is a, a shout out to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. That passage is known as the Shema. It was a Jewish prayer they would pray every day that said, I want to love you, God, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind. I want to seek you with everything that I am. I want to desire you. I want to long for more of you. Now, in the, in the scriptures, the heart was understood to be the center or the seat of all of your emotions. It was uh, to, you know, your, your, from desire to love, to reason, to belief, to trust. It was everything. And so to seek God with all your heart means to seek him with everything that you are, your entire being. And David's love for God is so undivided and pure that it motivates him to obey God. He's, I want to obey you, God, which is why he makes the request that he makes. He says, don't let me stray away from your commands. Why does he do that? Because he knows left to ourselves, tell me if this isn't true of your life, left to ourselves, we're going to wander. Left to myself, I am going to blow it, okay? 
And he knows that. And so throughout life, he, he, he doesn't want to do that. He's made mistakes before. And so he's leaning in and he's saying, I don't want to do that again. Help me stay true to your commands. Because if I follow my own way, I'm going to blow it. That's the heart of the, of the writer here. Now compare that with the average believer today. It's hard to have a heart devoted to God when there are so many things pulling it in so many directions. And what the author is saying in this passage is that his devotion to God comes first. Which means, God, tell me what you have to say because whatever you say goes. I want to know your commands, God. I want to follow you. I want to align my life with your word. When we read and we study God's word, our desire should be to meet with God, to know him better, and to align ourselves to his will. But that has to be something we actually want. And that's a huge struggle for people. Because does anybody here love being told you're wrong? Right? It's your favorite. I just love it when people tell me that I messed up. I mean, no one wants their sin pointed out to them. And so because of that, most people aren't even willing to expose themselves to God's word. Because as I said, every time I open the book, I get convicted. And I don't want to feel convicted. I want to I call that a lifestyle. I don't want to call that a sin. I want to call that my choice, my right. I don't want to call that a sin. And because we don't want to feel that conviction, we don't like being confronted by the truth, especially when it's hard truth. We just avoid the subject altogether. We don't open his word. I've said this before, but we need to ask ourselves this question. When something in your life feels good, it feels right, and you want it to be so true, but God's word tells me it's wrong, what has to bend? God's word or your life? Because you can't choose the parts of God's word you like and the parts you don't. It's not a smorgasbord. It's not a buffet. It's all or none. Now, I need to move on uh, to the next thought, but one final thought on this. Uh, how well are we doing helping our young people? You know, parenting is, is super tough. It's not for the faint of heart. Uh, as a church, we're, we're going to do everything we can to teach your kids and your teenagers how to follow him, but we get them just such a short time every week, and, and there's more and more activities, particularly for teenagers, that, that fight against youth ministry, and so less and less come to youth, and, and, and so we're trying, but, but we can only do so much, right? Their spiritual development is your responsibility, and it's more important than ever. They're facing temptations we didn't know anything about. I, I don't even know how they, they function in the world, and, and so their spiritual development is more important than ever. And as parents, we tend to spend tons of time for our kids making sure that they have every opportunity academically, athletically, with their extracurricular activities. We concern ourselves with whether they're are they eating healthy? Are they getting enough sleep? When we're sick, we take them to the doctor. But how much time are we spending on average considering, this, considering the spiritual health of our children? Like, I'm your pastor. I will confess, I don't spend enough time engaging my kids spiritually. I don't spend as much time engaging them spiritually as I do uh, trying to help them with their homework because I've forgotten high school math. Uh, and you know, watching football with my son and going to all their show choir events and helping all with, I love all those things. They're all good. They're beautiful. They're not bad. But let's not be surprised when we prioritize certain things and not others. And then our kids grow up and they decide for themselves that Bible reading is good, but optional. Prayer is something you do only when you're desperate because they're not going to do what you say. They're going to do what they see you do. We have a responsibility. Okay, I got to move on. Number two, not only do you have to, to want more of God's word, you need to internalize God's word. As we've said it lately, you've got to get it in your bones. It's got to be more than a book. It's got to be in your bones. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Scripture mem memorization is critical to growth. And, and can I just be honest with you? I don't love this. Okay? Now, I love the results of the scriptures I've memorized that I've, I've learned, and it's amazing how the Holy Spirit, like I need it in a moment, and the scripture just comes, and I, I wasn't thinking about it, and it's just there. I love the effects of having scripture in my life, but the actual memori memorization process, I don't love. Anyone love to memorize? Right? Anybody, anybody would say, I struggle to memorize scripture. Yeah, okay. Uh, so every, a lot of people make that excuse. I can't seem to memorize scripture. And yet we all memorize things every single day. So it's not that we can't memorize. Like you memorize a direction to your house. You don't have to think about it anymore. 
okay? Uh, if you're in high school, you have to memorize your locker combination and things like that. Uh, we've memorized the words to our favorite movies and the lyrics to our favorite songs and the stats of our favorite sports players and sports team. I mean, there was a, a time in my young life, um, like it was a different life, uh, where I listened to rap music all of the time. And, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to admit this to you. I'm 40 years old. I still know every word to Sir Mix-a-Lot's Baby Got Back. I don't know why. Like it's stuck. It's stuck in there forever. I can't get it back. It's gone. My brain space is gone. My point being this, we can memorize anything. We can memorize anything we want. The reason that memorizing scripture is difficult is because the things that we're being asked to memorize are counterintuitive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me illustrate it this way. I love riding motorcycle. Uh, this is a picture of sitting on a motorcycle. Why would you not love that? That's like the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Anyway, uh, say I'm riding this motorcycle and I'm cruising along and there's a left turn up ahead, okay? And I, I got to turn left. Which way do I push the handlebars? The intuitive, the natural thought would be, well, you want to go left, you push the right handlebar forward and you will go left. That would be incorrect. You actually push the left handlebar forward and lean into the turn. That is, everything about that is counterintuitive. And I had to do it over and over and over again uh, in the safety class that I got. Now, I've been riding long enough now, I make a left turn, I'm not thinking about that, I'm just doing it. But it was hard to remember because I had to... I had to memorize a new thing so that I could imprint over what was already in my brain. Does that make sense? The question is, what do I want the imprint of my life to be? I want to look like Christ. See, the way of Scripture, everything about it is counterintuitive. It is natural to you to want to be selfish. And the call of Scripture is to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. It is a call to self-sacrifice, a call to service, and that is opposite of everything that comes natural to us, okay? Now, at the time this was written, most people uh, didn't own their own copies of the Bible, were rare, everybody didn't have uh, the portions of Scripture that were written at that time. And, and so when people got their hands on something, uh, they would memorize, they would commit it to memory because they wanted to have it in them, shaping them. The reason that the psalmist makes this statement, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, is because he knows what comes naturally. It is our very nature to sin against God. It is our very nature to chase the selfish thing. And he's saying, I don't want to do that. And when you begin to fill your heart with God's word, you are actually re-imprinting your very nature. It's hard to overcome sin if you don't know what it is, if you haven't memorized the scriptures. The word tells us, if we'll open up this book, it will tell you what's wrong and what's right. It will tell you what's sin. It will tell you the things that fall short of God's standard, and it will tell you how to navigate those things, but you've got to know it. When we hide God's word in our hearts, it can imprint, actually imprint over our natural reaction to temptation. I love James Montgomery Boyce. He puts it this way in his commentary. He says, memorizing is precisely what it's called for, since it is only when the Word of God is readily available in our minds that we are able to recall it in moments of need and profit by it. Do you want your life to be shaped by God? Do you want your life to look like Christ? Do you want to have a cruciform life? Well, then number one, you have to want more of God's Word. Number two, you have to internalize God's Word. And then number three, you've got to dwell on God's word. You got to dwell on it. Verse 15 and 16, I will study your commands and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. The word study here is literally the word meditate, which gets a, a bad rap because of Eastern religion, but this isn't meditate as an Eastern religion, as in emptying your mind. This is meditate as in, you know, God, God's truth talks about meditation all the time, as in uh, to fill your mind with God's word. Somebody came up to me after first service and said, meditating is like marinating. It's marinating in God's truth, right? It, it's, it's not only just reading it, but considering it and paying attention to it and thinking over it and letting God's word fill our thoughts. And often our approach as Christians, if we read God's word, is to read it to do what? To finish. Well, I, I did the Bible through in a year. I checked all the boxes. I, I, I did good. And, and the writer says, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not just reading it. I'm studying the word. I'm reflecting on it. I'm asking, what does that mean for my life? I'm remembering and committing it to memory, and I'm turning it over and over and over in my mind until I can fully understand what God is saying, and it shapes me. Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers. 
And in that book, he found that whatever people wanted to excel at, they could excel at. There's definitely different skill levels and things like that, but people could become the best at something. And the only thing that made people better at anything, the only consistent thing was the amount of time they spent pursuing that thing. The amount of time in the pursuit, and not just a little time, 10,000 hours. That's what he found. If you want to master chess, hockey, golf, writing, music, it doesn't matter. Everything from arts to athletics to academics, the key to mastering something is around 10,000 hours. And I got to thinking to myself, what if, what if we could have that kind of exposure to God's word? What would, that, what would happen to us personally? What would happen to the church if all of us had that kind of exposure to God's word? And I know that 10,000 hours sounds crazy, but hear me out. If you just show up in this place one hour a week and you didn't miss, how many weeks in a year is that? That's not a trick question. 52, right? If you do that for 20 years, that's 1,300 hours a week, roughly 1,300 hours a week. If you add discipling someone to that or being discipled, now it's 2,600 hours a week. You add a community group to that. Depending on how much time your group spends in the Word, it's going to be somewhere between 3,100 and 3,900 hours in a lifetime, okay? That's a lot, and you haven't opened the Bible yourself yet. So imagine what would happen in your life if you would commit to open God's word and let your thoughts dwell on what you learn and what you will find, listen, it's not that you master the Bible or you master God, but that he masters you. 10,000 hours, you can be mastered by the master. And when I say it separate from the hard work, boy, I want that. But there's no way to get there except to get into his word. Now I'm going to turn it over to the campus pastors to wrap up, but I want, to, I want to leave you with a final thought. It comes from Hosea chapter 4. God is upset with Israel. He's making a case against Israel. I think that we could apply this to uh, our country, our nation, 2019 right now. He writes in Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you, saying, There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You make vows and then break them. You kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, one murder after another. That's why your land is in mourning and everyone is wasting away. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Does it sound like society at all? What's interesting is why. Look at what he says. Even the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea are disappearing. Don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. My complaint, you priests or the church, is with you. So you will stumble in broad daylight. Your false prophets will fall with you in the night and I will destroy Israel, your mother. My people are being destroyed. Watch, because they don't know me. I think this is the church today. I really do. God's people are once again being destroyed. Our marriages are falling apart. Our families are falling apart. We're living lifestyles that were way outside of God's standards, and we're just trying to justify them and say they're okay, but they're not. They're sinful, and we just want to call them the way God made me. We're blaming him for our sin. Churches are closing left and right. Hollywood is making a mockery of Christianity. Cults and false religions are popping up everywhere. Why? Because we can't defend God's word. Why? Because we don't know God's word, which means we don't know God. Now, we can name all the characters in our favorite show and all the stats of all our favorite players, but I can't tell you what's in my Bible. In fact, statistics would show that Christians spend about 26 hours a week on TV and media, which is crazy in itself. But what's depressing is that's about 50 times the amount of time a week we spend in God's Word. Which brings us full circle to our truth. The Bible is God's standard for believers but that doesn't make it important. The Bible is only as important in our lives as we choose to make it. And that brings us today to our dare. So here's the dare. We dare you to dive into God's word. I have no idea right now what your current Bible exposure is, but maybe this is just the dare for you. Is church the only place that you ever hear God's word? If so, that is something that we want to see 
change. And so today, we challenge you to begin to engage in the scripture as if you actually believe that they are words that came to us directly from God, that they are his inspired words. And they are not just given to us, but they are given to you as an individual. Maybe you just need to commit to actually bringing your Bible to church with you, actually start reading it outside of church, but not just reading it to complete it, but committing it to your heart, meditating on what it says asking God to show you what it is that you need to learn. And that leads us to our action step for today. So here's our action step. Commit to 90 days of Bible reading. And if you're, if today this is what you want to do, if you want to commit to that 90 days of Bible reading, I would love for you to circle the cross on your weekly handout or in your Ransom Church app, just click on the cross and fill, fill that out. Because we actually do want to walk with you. We will send you a link to a 90-day reading plan. We're not going to leave you high and dry to figure out what it looks like to read the Bible on your own for 90 days. We're actually going to hand you a guide to reading the Word for 90 days. And listen, if you start this and you miss a day somewhere along the way, don't let that discourage you. Don't try to catch up. Don't quit. Just start right where you left off. Committing to reading the word. When you get into the word and when you spend time with the Lord, what you will find is that all of the things that you read will begin to actually affect the way that you live. That God's word will master you. Because the Bible is the standard for living our lives. But like Phil said, just because it's the standard, that's not what makes it important to us. The Bible can only be as important to us as we choose to make it. So this morning, I'm going to leave you with this quote from Martin Luther. He says, God is everywhere. However, he does not want you to reach out for him everywhere, but only in the word. So will you take this dare today? Will you take the dare to get into God's word, to spend that time meditating on the words that he gave directly to us? Let me pray for you today. Jesus, this morning... We're thankful for your word. Thank you that you actually gave us this set of scriptures as a way to know how to live our lives, as a way to know how to navigate this world as we move toward you and toward spending eternity with you as we prepare for eternity. Thank you for giving us a road map. And Jesus, today in this room, I'm sure there are so many of us that are thinking, man, this is the dare I probably need to take. And this morning, maybe there are some of us in the room that have known you, Lord, for a long time. And maybe we've gone through times in our life where your word was so important to us, but we are finding ourselves in this moment. at a place where we have not been making your word a priority. And so today, Jesus, this can be a day to renew that. Maybe some of us in this room have never read your word. And this can be a beautiful day of starting this new thing, of growing to know you more and more. And Jesus, this morning, I just wanna pray for each of us in this room that are going to commit to take this dare, and even for the rest of us that aren't so sure we want to commit to this dare, but we are realizing right now that your word is important and we actually need to be spending time with it. Jesus, will you give us the courage to keep going when it gets hard? 
In the name of Jesus, I pray against any scheme of the enemy that would want to tell us that we can't keep reading because this is too boring. I can't understand it. I don't like the things that it's telling me. Jesus, will you just silence that so that we can continue on? Jesus, so that your word can change us and we can be a people that know you and we can be a people that create change in this world because we belong to you. Thank you so much, Jesus. And we love you. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen.